Uh, so welcome to this afternoon's session on Full Stack Reactive Java with Spring Framework 5, Spring Boot 2, and Project Reactor. Uh, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a principal technologist and Spring developer advocate with Pivotal, Inc. Uh, Pivotal are the makers of wonderful things like uh, Spring Framework, Spring Boot, Project Reactor, uh, Redis, RabbitMQ, Greenplum, a huge contributor to Apache Tomcat, huge contributor to Cloud Foundry Codebase. Uh, you may have heard of us. Um, I, uh, I blog somewhat regularly, well, okay, not very regularly, but as much as I can, at theHecklers.com. Uh, oh, I guess I should start that, right? Make it a little nicer. Oh, much prettier, okay. Um, and uh, I tweet all the time at MKHeck. Is anyone on Twitter? Anyone? Okay, a few hands, that's good. I can almost see. Uh, I live on Twitter, kind of sun up to sundown and points in between. Sometimes I have been known uh, to wake up in the middle of the night and grab my phone and tweet. Uh, I know it's uh, kind of a sad statement on who I am, but it is what it is. Uh, so uh, if I, I say all that to, to say this. I mean, we have a very limited time here today. Uh, the good news is we have an, an almost unlimited time afterwards. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, um, like I say, I love to code, I love to talk. Uh, so, I mean, hit me up. I'd, I'd be happy to talk more uh, at length about this. Uh, if you ping me on Twitter, that's probably the fastest and easiest way to reach me. Uh, but if you have questions, comments, feedback that don't fit into 140 characters or even 280 characters at some point, uh, I'm also a member of the slightly older and more established social network called email. Is anyone on email? Okay, a few more. Uh, I, like you, I have a half a dozen email addresses. These are my top two. Uh, one is my personal email address, mark at thehecklers.com. Uh, the other is my company email address at mheckler at pivotal.io. So please do reach out uh, and let's keep the conversation going. So who am I? Uh, I have co-authored a couple of books. I've contributed content and code to several others. Uh, I am a frequent uh, conference speaker kind of around the world. Uh, I have been to JFall before and love JFall. Is any, are there any first time JFallers here? Yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? Uh, very well run, great, uh, great venue, and uh, I mean, I can't say enough good things. And now with the VR uh, app, that's groundbreaking. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited. I can't, can't wait to see what happens next. Um, I'm an architect and developer, and as you might guess from the next uh, bullet point, where most of my expertise lies, uh, it's in the Java uh, uh, language and environment. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, I was recognized by my peers for contributions uh, to the greater Java community. So if you have anything to do with that, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate the vote of confidence. And as I like to say, I'm a seeker of a better way, as are you, or you wouldn't be here today. Uh, I think we fail to seek better ways out at our peril. Uh, we fail to learn new things at our peril, uh, both our personal and professional peril, but that of our organization as well. It's not good to learn new things just for the sake of learning new things, but, uh, but, but there it's very important, it's essential to learn new things because they bring different ways of solving problems to us. Uh, I like to say there's no golden hammer, there's no one thing that will solve every problem, but there are different tools that lend themselves well to different problem domains and different ways of solving problems that may have been intractable before, uh, and it certainly gives you more, more tools in your tool belt. <coughs> so, uh, with that, uh, you probably came to, to talk and uh, see Reactive. So, uh, I like to, to start with this quote by Rasen Stoyanchev. He's one of our Project Reactor team members. I think he summarizes it brilliantly in one statement. In a nutshell, reactive programming is about non-blocking event-driven applications that scale with a small number of threads with back pressure as a key ingredient. Why back pressure? Because it ensures producers do not overwhelm consumers. And there is so much uh, history and information I would love to share, but I could probably fill 45 minutes alone with that. Uh, so let's just kind of hit the high points here. Uh, Non-blocking event-driven applications. Uh, underneath the JVM, typically at the operating system level, everything kind of happens asynchronously, right? Uh, the JVM instilled this uh, model, this blocking model, which makes it much easier to reason about things, but it, it's a little artificial uh, in that uh, you issue a, a request and you wait, uh, and when uh, you, you need to scale, you spin up another thread, uh, scale, so to speak. And what happens is you have a lot of threads which spend a lot of time waiting. Uh, so it's a little artificial. It's not the best use of resources, scarce resources, uh, which kind of brings us to the next point. Uh, in a reactive model, you scale with a small number of threads. Sometimes people ask, what's my performance gain if I switch to a reactive model? Uh, probably the wrong question to ask, because in certain domains, you'll have a performance increase. In certain domains, you'll have a performance decrease. It's about, uh, it's about resource utilization and scalability, really. 
Uh, so so the, the performance thing, it depends. It depends on if you're applying it to the right, right domain, so to speak. <coughs> Back pressure is very important uh, because there are many cases where you have a slower consumer that can easily be overwhelmed by the flow of data that's coming to it. How do you deal with that? A uh, reactive programming model gives you the ability to, to signal from your slower consumer that, hey, I can't take that much right now. Give me a value. Give me a handful of values. Just give me some when I am ready for it. Uh, it doesn't shift the problem of, of faster producers, but it, or it doesn't eliminate it, but it certainly shifts it to where you're, you're dealing with that at the publisher level versus the subscriber level, which, which helps. Um, the Reactive Streams initiative. Uh, reactive extensions actually originated at, at Microsoft with Eric Meyer uh, when he created the Reactive extensions for Java, right? No, just kidding. Uh, reactive extensions for .NET. Uh, but of course, this, uh, this was a good thing. And, and pretty soon you saw Reactive extensions move into the JavaScript space, the Python, the C++, the C Sharp, and the Java space. Uh, Netflix kind of pioneered that work. Uh, but it didn't stop there. Some very, uh, very bright people got together and said, you know, this whole reactive thing looks like it could be very useful. Uh, and over time, things evolved. I, I should mention there was a manifesto, because nothing happens in our field without a manifesto, right? It, it, still awake? OK, all right. Uh, so, so at some point, a reactive manifesto was kind of penned, where, um, where it was stated that, you know, here are the things we're trying to accomplish. Here's why we feel this is a solution for this. And the Reactive Streams initiative was kind of a, an eventual out, outcome. Uh, reactive Streams specification, well, there, there are three parts to Reactive Streams. One is the specification itself, uh, one is the API, and one is the TCK, a technology compatibility kit. Because there are many companies, many organizations came together to, to create this Reactive Streams initiative. Uh, companies like Twitter, Kazing, uh, TypeSafe, uh, now Lightbend, uh, Pivotal, um, Red Hat, uh, you had Oracle uh, with uh, Java 9's uh, Java Util Concurrent Flow. I mean, you're, you're seeing reactive streams uh, being integrated into the JDK itself. Uh, and the reactive stream spec itself, the API has four interfaces, just four. It's very simple, very granular, and they're excellent building blocks. Uh, so you start with an interface for a publisher, and obviously that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, you have a subscriber. Uh, that will subscribe to the feed that the publisher is producing, which when the subscriber subscribes, uh, the contract is, is a subscription. And then you have a processor, which is an inter interface which implements both the subscriber and the publisher interface so that uh, some manipulation in, in, uh, can occur and, and pass on the, um, the stream. So you have a very simple, very low-level granular API that's defined. Uh, and that's very useful, it's very um, repeatable. But it's, it's a little too low level, right? Because you're going to have to have certain operator, operators that will apply that you can use over and over and over again. And you don't want to have to rebuild those each, uh, each application you write. Uh, so you have, you, I should say, you have players who have implemented uh, Reactive Streams compliant implementations, things like Aka Streams or Project Reactor or RxJava, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 2.x. Uh, so you have different. Uh, different implementations that can be certified as either partially or fully compliant and interoperable, which again is useful because all of these companies could have solved things in different ways, completely non-interoperable ways, but that doesn't really help all of us, right? Uh, so seeing that, they've cooperated, which is kind of nice. Uh, so a quick overview of Project Reactor. Uh, Project Reactor is, is kind of run and, and shepherded and guided by Pivotal. But uh, we also, one of our major committers is David Carnock, who is one of the, uh, the, the leads, or the lead for uh, RxJava. So we've got a lot of good cross-pollination going on. We work well uh, among the various projects to ensure that everybody is, is pretty, uh, you know, is, is pretty, uh, their contributions are, are taken into account and obviously work together to make things work together. Uh, but Project Reactor itself is a fully non-blocking foundation, uh, directly interacts with Java 8's functional API, completable futures, duration. So if you're comfortable and, and used to using those, uh, then you're not going to see much of a, a, a jarring change you know, to fully implement uh, Reactor. Uh, Reactor actually abstracts, or, or I should say specializes a bit for the publisher interface. Uh, so you'll, in many cases, you'll return a value or expect to return a value. And that's a mono. It'll either return zero or one values. Uh, a flux is a kind of publisher that will return zero up to an infinite number of values. And that may come very quickly. Uh, it may come uh, over an indeterminate amount of time. 
So that yields different kind of problems as well. So that's something that, uh, you know, again, varies between uh, expecting a value and expecting potentially unlimited stream of values. Uh, and of course, it has non-blocking inter-process communication, uh, leverages uh, HTTP, including like WebSocket, server sent events, which also is very useful when you're talking about multiple values coming over a long period of time. <coughs> so I think it's really helpful to see things in action because, uh, you know, it's good to talk about things and at least provide some kind of foundation and framework, but, but I think it's useful to see them uh, because that way you can see how they work. Uh, so let's code, right? Um, hopefully it'll go a little better than that, but it is a live demo, so what the heck, you know? You, you just never know. So um, I guess at this point I should ask, is anyone familiar with this? Yeah, okay. Yeah, lots of hands. This is the Spring Initializer. For those four who didn't raise their hands, uh, this is kind of where your, your, your journey to Spring-based microservices start. Uh, sometimes called by its URL, start.spring.io. Um, but it's a Spring Initializer. You can curl it. Uh, you can access it uh, via command line, uh, the Spring CLI. Uh, I go to the website because I like it. It's pretty. Uh, but I think it's also very clean and easy to get up and running that way. Uh, you have options, and uh, with, with Pivotal, th and this is one thing I, I often forget to mention, uh, different, different companies, different organizations have different ways of moving to a reactive model. They see the benefits, uh, but uh, sometimes with certain implementations, it's almost like you have to throw away everything that you've done up to this point, you know, all your, your hard-won knowledge over the last several years. And um, the Spring team took a little different approach. Uh, any Spring MVC developers out there? Yeah. So, so you're going to find the ability to, to leverage a fully reactive stack. Very, it's a very gentle on-ramp, if you want it to be, because uh, rather than just scrap MVC and replace with something else, uh, we're developing these in parallel. So you've still got your web MVC packaging, and you've got web flux packaging, which is named after, obviously, flux, uh, so, which adds a lot of work, really, for us but it makes it a lot nicer for, for anybody who's a developer and using this because uh, you can switch between a blocking model and a non-blocking model, maybe even within the same day or the same hour at work, and it, it isn't jarring. If you come from a functional reactive type of, of framework or background, I should say mental framework, uh, you can do that too. So we like to give you the choice and place that in your hands. We don't like to take that away and say, throw away what you've done, uh, which I think is kind of cool. Admittedly, I'm a little biased. But, uh, so we'll start here. I, I was going to ask, uh, well, I, I should say, uh, because you have options uh, here as well, uh, if you are a Maven developer, you can generate a Maven project. And by the way, the Spring Initializer doesn't generate code. It creates your project and your build file and, and your main application class and, and main method, but everything else is just kind of primed for you. But if you're a Maven developer, sure, develop, create a Maven project. If you're a hipster, you can create a, a Gradle project. So that's cool. We've got everybody covered. Um, and you don't have to use Java. You can use Kotlin or Groovy. I, I was going to ask, actually, anybody using Kotlin? OK, a couple, couple really strong hands went up fast, yeah. Um, so I was going to ask, uh, I could do this in Java. I could do this in Kotlin. Which would you prefer? I guess with the number of Java folks out here, stick with Java. Okay, we'll stay with Java, that's fine. I, remind me at the end, I have a repo that I have idiomatic Kotlin versions of everything I'm developing here today as well. Uh, so I mean, take a look at them and, and see what you think. Uh, but we would cover it all. I'm, I'm fine either way. Uh, so, so <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so we're gonna start off uh, with the Spring Initializer. It, it usually includes the current version of Spring Boot as well as one version back and an upcoming snapshot. In this case, we have to go up to the 2.0 milestone 5, well, the 2.0 snapshots are milestones, to get the reactive bits. Uh, Spring Framework 5, which released right after Java 9, uh, had three key features. One, it baselined at Java 8, so you get all the streams and Lambda goodness built into Spring Framework 5. Uh, it brought in uh, support for Kotlin as a first-class citizen, right, which was kind of nice. Um, Let's see, Kotlin Reactive. Yes, of course, that's why we're here, right? So it brought in that capability as well. Project Reactor doesn't, you don't have to use it in a Spring project, but it's a dependency. Uh, Spring is not a dependency of Project Reactor. Project Reactor is a dependency of Spring, right? So you can use Project Reactor in any Java project you want, or Kotlin, uh, or Groovy, for that matter. So we're going to go with uh, 2.0, which for Spring Boot goes officially GA this December, beginning of December. 
uh, but we've got the early bits to play with, and you can too. So I'm going to start off and just create a demo. I'm going to create a, a simple application. And uh, I'm, my colleague Josh Long and I got together a few months ago and, and thought, what kind of cool demo can we put together for this? Because we really wanted something new and novel that hadn't been done before. So we didn't want to do a chat app, and we didn't want to do a chess app, and those are awesome, but they've been done. So we thought, what can we do that's really new and unique that nobody's ever done before? So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could create an application that would stream movies, sometimes called flicks, right, over the internet? which is sometimes called the net. So we, we thought about it, we thought that would be so awesome, we'll call it Netflix. So we started really working on this and came up with, you know, some good, good you know, made some good traction and went to register the domain and wouldn't you know it, there is this tiny little startup in Silicon Valley just down the street which already has that registered. So we thought, well, you know, we don't really care about all those other movies. You know, we really don't, who cares? That's, that's blasé. We are concerned about reactive-themed movies, right? Because that's, that's what everybody wants to see. So anything that has to do with, like, Reactor or, or Fluxes or Monos or, or even Streams and Lambdas, this is what we really care about. And we thought, rather than Netflix, because they got rather grumpy about that, we would call it FluxFlix, right? So we're going to create a FluxFlix service today. Uh, and I'm going to bring in a couple of dependencies. Uh, the reactive web dependency, which brings in Spring Web Flux, as well as Netty. Uh, you don't have to use Netty. You can use any uh, Servlet 3.1 engine. Uh, but Netty was kind of first mover, and they're well established and rock solid, so we'll go with that. I'm also going to use reactive MongoDB. Now, Spring Data has different versions, like every other Spring component. Uh, and start, and it, they're alphabetical in the case of Spring Data, so, uh, so it goes like... Uh, Ingles, and I can't remember what J is, but K is K, literally K-A-Y. Uh, so Spring Data K and onward brings in reactive bits as well. So it supports anything that we have reactive drivers, access to reactive database drivers for. Mongo was first out of the gate, so yay for them. Uh, but, but it also currently supports uh, Cassandra and Couchbase and Redis, and more are going to be added. Now, we're never going to bolt a reactive programming model on top of a blocking database driver. Because that's just silly, right? I mean, you're adding potential complexity, and you're still blocking and waiting for your data store to respond. So you're gaining nothing. You're just hobbling yourself. So, so what we have access to now, and of course this is increasing, but we have Mongo, Cassandra, Couchbase again, and Redis. Uh, I'm going to go with Mongo because we love Mongo, right? Mongo's awesome. Uh, and then I'm going to bring in Lombok because I'm a lazy developer. Lombok helps you reduce your boilerplate, uh, the code you don't write, you know, you don't have to maintain, which is awesome. Uh, so we'll just start there. Uh, and I'm going to save this to my desktop. Hopefully Wi-Fi will be kind. And we'll open this. And we'll open it in our favorite IDE, which for me is IntelliJ. I, although I do love Eclipse, love NetBeans, we have full support for both those. Uh, in fact, we even have a build of Eclipse called Spring Tool Suite, which does, makes pushing code to the cloud actually pretty trivial, uh, so I'm a little jealous of that. Uh, let's, let's actually blow this up to where it's a little larger uh, type. Font. Uh, oh, it is on Embigonist. Um, well, let's see. Let's, let's open. Uh, whoops. That's, yeah, hold on. Let me close this out because I have some other code that's popping in there. So, Yeah, delete existing. There we go. Okay, so let me open. Nope. Come on. Yeah, we've got some, some issues here. So let me just create a directory here. New folder, jfall, right? And we'll generate this. Always a way around. Open. And we'll open. <coughs> okay, so let's see. Yes, okay, that looks much better. All right, so the first thing that we want to do is create our, our model, right? So since this is about movies, uh, I'm going to create a class called movie. Movie. By the way, uh, 
occasionally I'll get really spinning along fast typing, uh, so I will insert typos. Uh, I do that inten completely intentionally, by the way. Okay, not always. But anyway, the first few rows, you're close enough to see this stuff really well, so catch me on it. If I hit compile and you don't catch me, it's on you, right? Can everybody in the back see this? Is this big enough? Okay, if, if that changes, just yell out. Okay, so I'm gonna create a class called movie. Uh, and I'm going to create certain member variables like, uh, let's see, private string ID, private uh, string title for movies, that's probably enough. Uh, and then uh, this is a Mongo document. I'm going to annotate this with that document for Spring Data. Uh, and then I'm going to do an at data annotation for Lombok, uh, which gets me things like my two string, my hash code, my equals, uh, which is very, very nice. I'm also going to uh, have it create a noargs constructor for me. Again, no code. I don't have to maintain that. Uh, and then a required args constructor because I'm going to annotate this field uh, as non-null so that that will create me a single argument constructor. I'm also going to annotate this as my ID field, and bam, I'm done. So really nice, very maintainable. I'm also going to create a class called movie event. And by the way, if I do switch over to Kotlin halfway through this, let me know so I can switch back before we get too far down the rabbit hole, because uh, I kind of switch back and forth uh, probably too much. But I want to create an operational type of class, uh, operational type of stream of objects called movie events. Uh, if we're going to go live with this, we want to make sure that we are tracking what's being watched. Because if we have a movie that's only being streamed once a year, we probably don't want to keep that movie in our library. If we have a movie that's streamed 100 times per second, we probably want to find similar movies so we can add them to our collection. Uh, so what kind of things will we want to track with a movie event? Uh, probably like a movie ID, uh, and then uh, a date. Uh, so, uh, to do date, we'll call that field when. Oh, come on, I don't know. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. And again, we're going to use Lombok uh, to create a noargs constructor and an allargs constructor for us. Should work. Okay, now this, uh, oh, the one other thing we need to do is create a repository uh, for a movie, movie repository. Uh, and we'll extend our reactive CRUD repository. This is a repository interface that's created in Spring Data. Uh, and as you can see, it supports Webflux type return, uh, return types, so monos and fluxes. Uh, otherwise, it looks very similar to the regular concept in, in WebMVC of, or Spring Data per se, of, um, of your interfaces that are defined there as well. So it's very similar. Uh, so we're gonna override that, we're gonna extend that, excuse me, and we're going to create a repository for things of type movie uh, with IDs of type string. And that should be good enough to get us going, however, there's nothing visual, right? I mean, so far it looks like it should work, but we don't have anything showing this it works, and I'm kind of a visual person. So I'm going to create a command line runner bean. Uh, this is also an interface that's defined in boot. Uh, so this allows you to uh, create something that will run upon application initialization. Now, this is a functional interface with a single abstract method. And what can you do with a functional interface with a single abstract method. You can provide a lambda as the implementation, right? So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna call this demo data, and we're going to inject our movie repository. Uh, let's see, so return args, and there's our lambda. So now let's create some data. So uh, we're going to do a flux.just and create some movie titles. Now, this is the most important part of this demo. Okay, this is all data driven. So this is the absolutely critical part. If we don't get this right, nothing else works. So I need some reactive movie titles. Either things that speak directly to it or mention or, or imply things like, uh, like there was a movie with a flux capacitor in it, right? So back to the future, right? And actually, um, Phil Webb, co-creator of Spring Boot, uh, threw this one out there. The silence of the lamb does, right? Really clever, that Phil. Ugh. I, I just, as soon as you see it, you go, ah, oh, why didn't I think of that? Uh, let's see, so uh, how about enter, enter the void? Only in this case, since we're talking uh, reactive, enter the mono void, right? Void, yeah. Um, let's see, what else, what else do we have, anybody? Somebody has to have something, come on. 
What, what is it? Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, we'll go with that. Fluxes gone wild. All right. I don't even want to ask. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> what, what, what was it? Last of the... Last, last of the monos, yes? Yeah? Okay. W what was it? Oh, that's awesome. The flux, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, I have to throw this one in. Um, there's an Alfonso Cuaron film uh, called Itu Mama Tambien. In Spanish, it's in your mother as well. Uh, if, we, if we give that a reactive spin, it's Itu Mono Tambien. Uh, any hispano out here? Yeah, so you know that mono means monkey in Spanish. So we actually take it from mother to monkey, which killed him in Barcelona. But, uh, uh, so, so that's a start. But believe me when I say that if you think of something else, if you think of another title, please just stop me and yell it out. It means that much. This is important. Because if we don't have good data, again, the rest, who cares, right? So we're going to take these values. This is a flux of strings, right? So we're going to map that flux of strings. We're going to take these titles. And let's see, we'll do a, a new movie, movie. And we'll use that uh, as our title. And then we're going to flat map that. So we'll take our movie then. And we'll do a movie repository.save of our movie, right? Uh, and then, again, like streams, you have to have a terminal operation to kind of kick off the party. So we're going to do a subscribe, uh, and we're just going to do a, a system.out print line so we can see what's going on, because I like to see what's going on. And that should do it. But we can improve on this just a little bit, uh, because when you have a Lambda with a single parameter, what can we do? We can replace that with a method reference. Uh, so that cleans that up just a little bit. Uh, so let's see, boom, boom. Okay, so that's not bad. But we have an issue with our code. We don't have a bug, because I don't bug my code. I find it's really a time saver. If you don't ever bug your code, you don't ever have to debug your code. So i just just throwing that out there. But right now, every time we restart our application, we're going to do that a few times today, uh, we're going to add these same records to our data store, right? That's a little problematic. Because even though we're using Mongo, at, at some point, some of those may actually be saved. So, so we want to somehow clean that out. Really? Oh, you guys must all love Mongo. Oh, OK. Well, all right. I'll try to behave then. Uh, so, so each time we restart, we kind of need to do some housekeeping and make sure that we clear all those out before we add the records back in. So what I'm going to do is just do a movie repository dot delete, delete all dot block. Ooh. Now, now, that's a legitimate operator, right? I mean, it, it's, it's in there. It's in the API. But anytime you're doing reactive programming, you're doing it so you don't have to block, right? So when you see something like this, it probably should make you question your life choices. Uh, so we're, we're going to, if only there were some more idiomatic way of waiting to be, for the signal that something had completed and then kicking off the next step without actually physically blocking, right? Uh, so, so there is. Uh, we can do a then mini, which takes a publisher and produces a flux, a specialized type of publisher coming out the other end. So it, it does effectively the same thing, but it is more idiomatic, and it just makes me feel less dirty. So there we go. So this should work. So let's go ahead. Oh, I did forget one thing, uh, because I'm, I'm assuming Mongo is running, and Mongo isn't running. Uh, so what I actually can do a couple different ways. I can either run it locally, or what I like to do is just use an embedded version of Mongo called Flapdoodle. Isn't that so cute? I just, I don't know. I just like the name. So, <laughs> so here we go. We're going to rerun that, and that should, make, that should make everything much happier. Flapdoodle. All right. So here, we see that we have some, some movies now that are being stored, which is good, right? Now we're reactive from our application down to our data store. So that's good. That's the first step. So now that we have that step done, uh, we probably should do something more, right? We should probably define our service interface, internal API, if you will. Uh, so we'll create a class called movie service, cleverly enough. Uh, and then I'm going to inject uh, my movie repository, right? Uh, boom, boom. And then let's define our API. So we will probably want to return a flux of type movie so we can get all movies. We figure that's going to be a big thing. We're going to want to do that. 
Uh, we also want to return a mono of type movie, right? So we can grab a particular movie. Uh, we'll say get movie by ID, and we'll pass a string so we can grab the particular movie we're interested in. And then we also, again, for operational purposes, we'll want to be able to, to uh, get a look at all of our movie events. Uh, so get events for a particular movie ID, right? So let's start with that, and we'll build out from there. That's a very basic API, but we can run with that. Uh, so to get all movies, we should just be able to do a return this.moviepository.findall. And since we're not in Kotlin, I'll put the semicolon on there. Makes the compiler happier. Uh, we, to get a particular movie by ID, we'll do a return this.moviepository.findById and pass the ID. Pretty straightforward, just a, a pass through. <coughs> now here's where it gets interesting, I think, because if we had a million subscribers, we would probably have access to like an in-memory grid showing who's watching when, where, and we could just grab this data and feed it back. But we don't have a million subscribers yet. In fact, we don't have 100 subscribers yet. And in fact, if you subscribe today, you'll be our first subscriber. So just keep that in mind. By the way, investment options are open as well, so if you're interested, come see me afterward. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, so uh, what, what are we going to do? We're going to fake it till we make it. We're going to generate some of these. So we'll do a flux.generate, right? Uh, and I'm going to uh, create a synchronous sync, and we'll do this. We'll just generate some movie events. Uh, new movie event based on the movie ID and the current timestamp. Uh, and that's great. That gets me a whole bunch, just as, as many movie events as my laptop can create as fast as it can create them, which is great, I guess, in some ways, but it certainly doesn't make it easy to follow uh, here on, on stage. So I'm going to slow that down a little bit. I'm going to delay the output. Uh, so we'll just produce one per second. I'm going to go back up here and specify uh, movie events. And that looks like it should work, right? If only there were some way to test code. If only there were some way, other than deploying it to production, of course. I mean, that's a test, but it's probably not a test that's going to make your, your company very happy. Uh, I was actually chatting with somebody in the hallway a few minutes before I came in here, and they said that there's this cool key combination in IntelliJ. Yeah, look at that. OK, so apparently there is a way to test code. So let's try this. We'll see what happens. Was anybody aware of that, by the way? Yeah, nobody tests. OK, yeah, a couple people. OK, that's good. So, so you, you folks win t-shirts, the rest of you go back and read up on testing. Um, so what do we want to do? Well, I'm going to first uh, run with Spring Runner class, annotate this as a Spring Boot test, and then I want to inject uh, a, let's see, a movie service, right? Movie service, so we can leverage our internal API, kind of nice. I'm going to name my test something a little more descriptive. I'm going to take 10. I'm going to try to get 10 events and see how that works. Uh, so the first thing I need to do is create a string uh, variable for a movie ID, and then I'm going to do a movie service .get all movies .block first .get ID. Now, I am blocking, but what I'm doing is blocking in a unit test. And all I'm doing at this point is, is just telling Mongo to return all the movies but stop at the first one. So I kind of get just a random movie, right? And I'm going to grab that idea ID, and I'm going to use that in my test. Uh, now, this is the second most important part of this talk. I always try to dress appropriately for my talks. Does anyone know what this is, by the way? The tar, yeah. <laughs> OK, who let Captain Obvious in? Uh, all right, so who said TARDIS? Oh, excellent, OK. so so. You're my new best friend, and you just, why, why are you here? Anyway, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, uh, I try to dress appropriately, and this is, this is one thing that's really cool about this. Uh, because in a blocking model, it's relatively easier to test. Because when you issue a request, and you get a response, and you check out what you're getting back, that's pretty straightforward, right? At least relatively so. Uh, when you're dealing with a flux, uh, you may get three values in three seconds, and then maybe wait another 10 seconds for a fourth value, and maybe wait a week for the fifth value. How do you unit test that? The, the answer is not easily, right? Uh, but what we have in here is a capability to time travel. That's the, the Doctor Who reference. For those of you who didn't know this was the TARDIS, that's your weekend's assignment, right, to catch up on Doctor Who. So 
you'll thank me later. Uh, so we're going to use a step verifier, which is in package reactor test, and we're going to use with virtual time. So we're going to compress time, which is kind of a nice little useful thing. Uh, so we're going to do a new, uh, actually I'm going to just do a movie service dot get events for our movie ID that we grabbed earlier, and I'm going to take 10 of those. This is an example of back pressure, because what we're saying is our, our subscriber is saying, just give me 10 of whatever you're giving. That's it, no more, no less, just 10. Because that way we can evaluate this, we can test this. Uh, so let's see, we'll then await a certain amount of time. Now we know, because we wrote the code, that we are gonna expect a value every second. So we could wait about 10 seconds, but out of an abundance of caution, I'm gonna say wait 10 hours. Because hey, if you're time traveling, what does it matter, right? Uh, so then I'm going to expect next count, and I should expect 10 values coming out of that. And then I'm going to verify complete. And this should work. So let's find out. <coughs> mm. Oh, yes. Uh, this is one of the hazards of switch switching back and forth between Kotlin and Java. Uh, it, Colin really spoils you. By the way, if, if you didn't know this already, guess what? No semicolons required. So, and, and what, I, how did I miss that? Well, it seems happier, so, okay. All right, so this is good. Green bars are good, right? Because they mean one of two things. Either your code works or your unit test doesn't. So let's find out which it is. Uh, I'm going to change this to, ex it, it, it thinks it's going to get 11 values. Uh, we know for a fact that we're requesting 10, so this should fail. Hopefully it'll fail. That'd be really awkward. Okay, it did fail, so that's good. Uh, I'm going to put it back because I'm a little uh, OCD, and I want to make sure that this works, leave, it every leave everything in a workable state. Yay, it works. Okay, so that's good. So I'm going to close this out now. Uh, let's see, so close that. And yeah, okay. So we've created our internal API, we've tested it, we've tested the difficult part of that, we see that that works. So the next logical step is to create our external API, right? Uh, so I'm going to create a REST controller and uh, do a request mapping for slash movies. Movies, okay, class, quote, controller, uh, private, final, movie service, uh, because I want to leverage our internal API again externally, which is nice. Uh, and I'm going to do a get mapping, public, flux, movie, same type of thing. We're going to want to expose this externally as well. Uh, we'll say all. I'm going to do a get mapping uh, for slash ID, uh, so we can grab a particular movie, public, mono of mono of type, of type movie. <laughs> uh, and we'll look for that by ID. Uh, using a path variable, string ID. Uh, and then finally, we'll want to do a get mapping slash ID slash events, because we want to grab those movie events and see what they're doing, right? Uh, so public flux movie movie event uh, events. Uh, once again, leveraging a path variable, string ID. OK, so let's code these. Again, we've kind of done the hard work already, right? So return this dot movie service dot get all movies, semicolon, hee <laughs> hee. And for a particular movie, return this dot movie service dot get movie by ID, passing the ID. And for our movie events, return this dot movie service dot get events, passing the ID. And that's almost enough. <coughs> REST controllers by default return application JSON. Uh, for an indeterminate number of values, we need to either leverage something like WebSocket or server sent events. Uh, since this is a feed of one-way values, this makes a lot of sense to leverage uh, server sent events. So I'm going to specify that this produces uh, media type, media type, type, uh, dot, text event stream value, which is a way of signaling to the controller, produce a stream of server sent events. So this looks very familiar, right? Coming from the Spring MVC world, the only thing that's kind of different is, is your, your return types. But the heavy work, the hard work, has already been done for you by Spring WebFlux. So that's kind of nice. You can switch between MVC and Spring WebFlux very easily. It doesn't take a lot of uh, gut-wrenching change to, to take advantage of a full reactive stack. Again, assuming this works, so let's make sure that this works.
And of course it works, because again, I don't bug code. So let's, let's go ahead and try this. Uh, let's test it, because again, it's kind of nice to make sure it, you know, verify, it's trust but verify. I use HTTPy. Uh, you're welcome to use curl or whatever, but with HTTPy, you can omit the, uh, the host name if it's local host, so that's kind of nice. And it gives you this beautifully formatted color output. Isn't that pretty? Uh, so I like that. Uh, so if we want to grab a particular ID, let's grab Lord of the Flux here. And yep, that works. So let's test our events endpoint uh, and make sure that that works. And bam, oh, isn't that nice? Okay, so we know that everything is working right. We're publishing, we're creating a stream of server sent events, everything's going great, but we can fix it. So let's, let's break this. Because what if you're not coming from a Spring MVC world, right? There, there should be some functional reactive approach to this, right? There is. Uh, so what I'm going to do is create a route functionally. So I'm going to create a bean. Uh, let's see, router functions, router function for uh, server responses, right? Uh, so let's see, router function. Uh, I'm, I'm going Kotlin here in my head, and it's, uh, it's messing with me. So return router functions dot route. So we're going to create some routes. Uh, so we do uh, use a request predicate dot get, right? Uh, and we'll do a slash movies for starters. And then let's see, um, we need to do a new handler function, right? Which is, is great, except for one thing. You know what this is? Yeah, it's an anonymous inner class. It's kind of ugly, isn't it? You know, this is Java 8. We shouldn't be using this stuff. Uh, so all we really care about is, is this, this method. We need to have a way to take a server request and return a mono of type server response. So a really great way of doing this is just to spin up a component, right? And we'll call this class movie handler. And we'll inject our movie service. So once again, we can leverage our, our work we've already put in, which is kind of nice. And then I'm going to create some methods here. So uh, in this case, I'm going to, uh, to replace our all. I'm going to just do a return server response dot OK. And we'll create the body uh, using our movie service dot get all movies. And we'll return objects of type movie class. There we go. Pretty simple. Uh, so now let's do by ID. Uh, because we want to be able to return a particular movie by ID. So we'll return server response dot OK. Body, once again, movie service dot get by ID. Uh, we'll take our request and we'll extract the path variable from that. And again, we'll return objects of type movie, right? Uh, this is a little different here for our events. Uh, so we once again do a return a server response dot OK. Uh, we'll, for our body, we'll use our movie service get events, uh, passing our request, uh, extracting the path variable, and return objects of type movie event. <coughs> and this is close, but again, we need to specify somehow that this isn't coming back application JSON. So we're going to specify a content type, uh, media type dot text event stream. And now we can take this and we'll inject our movie handler. So then we can leverage that. So we can get rid of this horrible abomination here that we almost created, uh, because that's just ugly, right? So uh, we'll take our handler. Actually, I'll take a request, and we'll feed that to our handler dot all. And that's good. Uh, let's add a route, request, predic request predicates dot get. We'll do another get for slash movies. ID, right? So we can do this. We can uh, hit our handler and request a particular movie, right? So we'll pass our request. And finally, we'll do another route. Route request predicates dot get uh, for our movies ID, ID for our events. Uh, and we'll take our request, pass that to our handler uh, for events request. And that's pretty good, but I think we can do a little bit better. Because once again, we have a, a single parameter lambda. We can replace that with a method reference. Let's do it again. Boom. And one more time. And then we can use a static import to kind of clean this up just a little bit. 
No? Boom. So now, that's pretty clean, right? Oh, we're close on time. Okay, so that's pretty clean. Let's make sure that we have everything still working. That's always a plus. Uh, so let's see here. Boom, boom, run. Boom. Okay. So now, really quickly, uh, we'll verify that this works, and then we'll see how fast we can create a web client, because that's always fun. Okay, so once again, uh, let's do movies. Still works. Defining it differently still works. That's always a plus. Uh, we'll take Lord of the Monos, plop that in there. That all works. Events, dash S. Bam, two different ways. Okay, so it all works. This is great. So you have choices. If you're coming from an MVC world, that's great. If you're coming from a functional world, that's fine too. Uh, you can use what is more comfortably idiomatic for you as well. So that's great. We've created a, a producing service that, that leverages publishers. What if you wanted to consume this across, uh, across processes? So it would be really cool if we had a web client that could do that. Uh, we're down to what, like four minutes? Probably fine. We can do this. So I'm going to create a Flux, Flux client, right? And I'm going to remove Mongo because we don't need that for our client demo, right? So I'm going to save that and we'll go here. Come on. There we go. We'll open that up. And we'll open that in IntelliJ. And then the first thing I'm going to do is make sure I don't have a uh, port conflict. That's always a plus. And then we'll go to our main application class. And let's do this. So I'm, the first thing I'm going to do here is create a bean. Uh, let's see, we'll do a web client, client. Um, uh, boy, I'm just, I'm cotlining out here. Um, so return, oh, come on, typos galore. There we go, return web client dot create. Uh, and I'm going to Start with a uh, URL. This is optional, but I like to do it because everything is going to feed off of this anyway. So it saves a little bit of typing down the road. Uh, so that gets me my web client. And now I'm going to create a, once again, a command line runner bean. Demo, two minutes. We can do this. OK, web client. Can he do it? It's possible. OK, so return args. Boom. OK, so let's get this party started. Uh, Client.get. Uh, we're going to retrieve the URI that we've already created. That's fine. Uh, so we'll, oh, create body to flux. And just in the interest of time, I'm going to do a little bit of copy paste uh, because it will probably be faster than my typing even. Uh, so I'm going to grab this. Um, and let's go to the bottom here and do that. Sure. And we'll get rid of this. And we'll get rid of this. And. We'll get rid of the typo here that is just begging to happen. OK, so now I'm going to convert this body to a flux uh, of type movie, right? And then let's filter that. Uh, so I'm going to uh, take my movie and movie.gettitle.equalsIgnore case. Uh, which one do we want to grab here? Uh, let's see, how about uh, well, last of the monos? That's what came up at the top. We'll just start with that one. So we're going to grab last of the monos. Um, so then let's flat map that. And we'll take that movie, right? And we'll do a client dot get dot oh, here dot Yuri. And we'll add on ID slash events. And we'll take our movie dot get get ID. Uh, and let's do a retrieve, and we'll do a body to flux of type movie event dot class, uh, and then let's subscribe. Uh, let's see, system dot out print line, just so we can see what's going on, right? Okay, so how are we on time? Oh, uh, you're killing me, Smalls. Okay, and they're not even in the front row. What what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So look, we have movies. We're streaming. So we have a reactive web client. Again, no blocking that occurs anywhere from the client, uh, you know, with the client subscriber, the publishers that are in our backing service, all the way down to the metal, right? So that's good. Uh, we feel like we've done a good thing here. So now let me wrap up strong. 
and uh, show you this, because sometimes I forget this, which is always a little anticlimactic. If you want more information, hit the reactivestreams.org site. Uh, that's where you can find out probably more than you'd ever want to know about the Reactive Streams initiative. Good stuff, though. Uh, Project Reactor is our homepage for Project Reactor. Like, uh, makes sense. And everything you saw here, as well as fully idi idiomatic Kotlin service and client, are in the FluxFlex intro under my repo. Josh and I have created actually a more exhaustive uh, in uh, intro with more information, with more code. Uh, and we've even pressed into service some of the uh, spring, um, uh, spring security folks to do a reactive security uh, element to that as well. So good stuff in there. Please check it out. And uh, thanks for coming. And thanks for inviting me. So.